in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind and set liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's faith. Amen. I don't know. That's what God has called us to do. If I can get you to do anything, memorize Luke 4.18. You don't have to memorize 19, but you do need to memorize uh, Luke 4 and 18. Now, it's okay if I take my time today. Yes, sir. <clears throat> That's why, you know, song we wasn't humming songs we want. So just give about five. You know, that was really for me today. I needed some, I needed some warfare music. After watching that movie yesterday, I mean, they put me in the spirit of war. War! You got your weapon? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I grew up. I grew up reading comic books. You know, that's, they helped us. Those that didn't like to read, and we'll find something you like to read. So I love reading comic books. So I learned how to read. The Avengers Endgame. If you like battle scenes, it's full. So I'm watching it, and I'm, I'm all excited. And Saint Luke, fourth verse eighteen. I mean, fourth chapter, eighteen verse. Hmm? I can't hear you. You weren't talking to me, were you? No. Okay. That's how was that. Okay. What was that funny? First Peter chapter two. Looking at uh, verse number four through six. And it reads, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men. First Peter chapter two, verse four through six. Come to him as a as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So today we want to try to talk about shame, fear, and control. Shame, fear, and control. Okay? The promises in this scripture is, he who believes on him, Jesus, will by no means be put to shame. And another version say, and one believing in him should not be ashamed, never. Clark says, by no means be put to shame he who comes to God through Christ for salvation shall never be confounded. He need not ha haste excuse me, he need not haste to flee away for no enemy shall ever be able to annoy him. Wouldn't that be good? Yet notice that this verse also has another promise. Rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious. John 15 uh, chapter 15, verse 18 through 20. Uh, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So this promise is not that we will never be or feel rejected. In fact, it promises us that we will be rejected by people. But that regardless of whatever we experience from others, we can have as a firm foundation that we are chosen by God and precious. This is one of the things I believe has sustained me over the years. I feel you know, like everybody else, I have had my ups and downs. Uh, sometimes, you know, listen, things happen in life. Mm -hmm. And you do get rejected. You do get pushed to the side. 
even within your own family. But hey, it's part of the whole package. Even Jesus was kicked to the curb with his whole family. So listen, there is no exception to this rule. Like he said, if uh, you are in me or if you love me or you, I'm in your life, the world's going to hate you just like they hated me. So I think that is something that we should be encouraged about and think about when you run into your trials and your tribulations and your persecution, that you are following your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These are the same things that he went through. Now, I've said on occasion, step to get this water, we need water. I've said on occasion that if we really gonna truly be followers of Christ, then we need to understand exactly what what we're signed up for. Or better yet, what we volunteered for. Because we all volunteer to be saved, right? I mean, God didn't shake us like he did. Moses grabbed him and got get ready to sacrifice him because he didn't do what he said. We chose to be born of the Spirit of God. We asked him to come into our life. Is that correct? Amen. So this was a volunteer thing. It wasn't something that was made, made us do that we had to do. So if, if he's going to go through these things, then we need to understand that as his followers, if we're really following him, we might as well arm ourselves and our mind to understand that we're going to go through similar things. We may not be put on a cross and crucified, but death is a part of the package. And this is the thing, you know, that I, when I look at Christians, talk to Christians, everybody get excited about the salvation part. But when you talk about the dying part, it seems like, you know, you just messed the party up. You're a party pooper, you know. Why did you, you have to say anything? You know, the party was going good until you mentioned the fact that if you're really going to follow him when the days of persecution come, and they are coming. And they're just around the corner. They overseas. They start to show his ugly head here. But it's not solidly here, but they are coming. And so if they persecuted him till death, then those of us that really follow him will also be persecuted and we also will die. So this is something we need to arm ourselves with. I remember when I was growing up, Kids, teenagers, young people, death we don't want to talk about. You know, we want to believe that we were bulletproof, we were supermen, that you know, nothing ever gonna to touch us. But as we lived, then we learned that none of us are superhuman, none of us are bulletproof, and yes, we can die. Okay? Now, that's sort of morbid, isn't it? It's encouraging to me. It's encouraging in this way. If they are persecuting me for something that I have not done, but just for following Christ, then I can say that I'm in the right place. But they persecute you for something you've done, well, you need to repent and get yourself straight, right? So as we are following Christ, then, things are going to happen to us, and we're just going to arm ourselves with the thought that as they did our father, our brother, they're going to do the same thing to me. So praise God for that, all right? Because the world loves its own, and it hates those who are not following them. When I see Christians starting to mimic the world, I get a little concerned. Who is following whom? We are supposed to set an example to be followed, not follow the world. The world should come to our light, not us to that darkness. But things have flipped over. So we started to call that which is good, bad. And that which is bad, we're starting to call it. All you got to do is listen to the news, listen to the television. Everything has been flipped upside down. This evening in the church, in some places, things have been flipped upside down. We're in a different time, but yet it's the same time. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Why do I say that? Because there is nothing new under the sun. What has been will be again. All right? So things that we're seeing, things that we're dealing with have already, already been, and it's been again. We just need to open our eyes so that we can see it and understand, hey, this happened before. And it's starting to happen again. All right? So what does that got to do with shame, fear, and control? Quite a bit. All right? So this promise is not that we will never be or feel rejected. It's the opposite. We will be rejected. Unfortunately, I, I've said sometimes when people, especially new people, they come to a church that they've ever been in. Can I use you, Pastor McNeil, as an example? I'm going to use you anyway. I remember when it was on Logan Street and Pastor Burke came and, you know, I think the music for a first year. 
you know, just looking around, eyes got big, like you say, man, I'm in the wrong place. How did I get in here? Yeah, because the music was different if you've never been in that environment or listened to that kind of music. And so, but it surprised me that she came back the next week. You know, and she came back, she's still looking around, but she sort of sat toward the back. So if anything crazy happened, she could escape. So I watch people where they sit at, you know. The more comfortable they get, the closer they come in. I do the same thing, all right? And so eventually, she got used to the music. She got used to the preaching. And next thing I know, it's been 20 plus years, and you know, she no longer tries to sit by the door and run. But people come with, a, with this crazy expectation, I'm looking for people like me. And un unfortunately, until you have been here a while, there are not gonna be many people like you, but they, will have, they, they used to be like you, but they're no longer like that anymore. That make any sense? People come with their expectations, they come with all of their hurts and all the disappointments, and they want to know if there's any people in there like them. So what we normally say what is that we used to be like you. And what do you mean? When God began to heal us, God began to take us through deliverance so that now we're no longer like that, but we still can identify with where you are because we've had those same experiences. And so the more they get comfortable, the more they will come in and grab with you. But it's not normally start out that way. People first got to check you out, make sure that you're not a kook, that you're not going to do anything crazy. And of course, I just go, let's just bust that bubble. I'm a kook. I do things crazy. I, do, I don't do things that's normal. All right? Let's get that on out of the way. Let's put that on the table deal with that. Because wherever you have been, I promise you, I don't do that no more. I came out of that environment. So I said, what you see is what you get. Ain't no telling what that might be. We try to follow God. So, biggest thing is, people feel uncomfortable because they haven't been healed on the inside. They feel rejected because that's all they've experienced. But when people start loving on them, hold, grab them, and you know, kiss and hold them, say, "How you doing?" You know, they sort of, "What a, you know, I'm not used to this. What are you doing?" I'm just. Do what Jesus can do. But how do we get to that point? First is we have to do the same thing that we all went through. And it's a process. I promise you, we didn't do this overnight. No, if you if, if most of them was like me, I know you didn't do it overnight because I ran half the time because I wasn't sure what I was getting into. And I had this thing on the inside of me, been burnt before, don't want to get burnt. Twice. And so I try to keep everybody at arm's length until I find out you're not going to hurt me. That I can trust you a little bit. Can I be honest with you? I don't care how long we've been at this thing. We still have some areas on the inside of us where the walls are still up. Yeah, come on. Come on. Talk with me now. The walls are still there. I can tell. I'm sure you can tell. There's certain areas yet that's uh, not completely healed or not completely surrendered that I'm willing to allow people to get in there. Because if you do, I, I stand the chance of you taking a knife and, and wounding me again. So there are certain places we sort of keep people away from until we get to the place where I can truly trust you and I just open up fully to you. <laughs> Maybe not in this lifetime, but, but we're working on it. All right? Even with couples that's been married for years. I, I promise you, there's still areas in each other's lives that you haven't fully opened up. There's things that, that, that hurt you so deeply and wound you so badly, you don't want nobody to know what you went through. We're just being honest. We're just talking, all right? We deal with that shame factor. When we have been, when we've had a shame in instance to happen to us, until we have really, really gotten all that stuff worked out, we don't just allow everybody to just get up in there. I told Valerie, I said, you know, girl, I'm not doing this twice. I mean, three times. She said, what do you mean? I said, I allowed you into areas of my life that I never let nobody into. I took a risk. I took a chance. I said, I'm never doing that again. Because it took decades to allow that. 
And so relationships are the same way. It takes a long time to allow someone those intimate areas on the inside of you, even though you may call them brother or sister. They may be an apostle or prophet. Who cares who they are? They're not getting up in there because you, you run the risk of them doing something that's to you. And that's just being honest. And we're a deliverance church. All right? And, you know, I'm not going to shoot you no hyperball. You know, everything is perfect. No, everything is not perfect. We are still working on this journey. We haven't arrived yet. I still have praise on inside me. I'm waiting on God to heal. And it's just a fact. So when we start talking about shame, fear, and control, it's real. Things that happen to people, they are real. It's not in their mind. It's not in their imagination. Your hurts was real to you. My hurts are real to me. That make any sense? You may not be able to identify with what I went through, but they're real to me. And we need to appreciate that fact that I can't fully appreciate what you've gone through, but I can understand some of it. And I allow you that opportunity to let God bring full healing to you. We are, we're not there yet. It's just like I ran to a lady, and this pastor rebuked her because she was still mourning. And I said, he did what? He said, my mourning period is over, and I should have stopped. I wanted to slap him. Yes, I wanted to slap that preacher. Not with the Holy Ghost either. Because nobody can tell me how long my mourning period is. Only God can do that. We all are different. We all mourn differently. You can't tell me when it's over. God tells me that. It's over when it's over. When it's over, we just stop. But nobody will come in and put a time clock on you. You got 90 days to mourn, then you got to get back back to business. No, I mourned over 20 years for my mother. Over 20 years. It took me a long time to get over that. And so I tell people, you can't tell me how long I should mourn. I mourned until it was all gone. The same thing with shame, fear, and control. You are born of the Spirit of God now, and you shouldn't have no more fears. You shouldn't feel that way. Who are you talking to? I don't care how much deliverance we've gone through. Can we just get honest here? We're all indifferent, and it takes us all time to get past stuff. Only God knows when you have gotten past or when he has fully healed. You'll know. Because when you know, you can open up, you can talk about it. You don't have those feelings no more. That that, that weeping never comes back. Actually, you can start laughing. I can talk about stuff now in my life I could never talk about before. Because I was too afraid of someone taking it and turning it or using it against me. I told one fellow, you know, I know we had a like to talk. And I was laughing and joking with him. I said, you know, I told you some intimate stuff. And you know why I told you? He said, no, what? That's because I'm healed. So even if you decide to go, and he did, even if you decide to go use it, it doesn't affect me no more. Right, right. I said, you will. Because yeah. part is part nature of people. But it's, it's when we get beyond stuff that we can begin to open up we can talk about it. We can laugh. It don't hurt anymore. In fact, we can start laughing about it. I mean, I can laugh about stuff now. Whereas before, just think about it. Just make me go to a corner and just bawl my eyes out. But it was a process. First, salvation. That was a big part of the process. Not just going to church. Going to church is good. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, can I be honest with you? I, I tell you, like my wife said, her grandmother told her, don't be messing with them Christian folks. Stay home. Go to a club and do something. Don't be going to that. You know, people go to church and they're not, they're not serious. But when you really get born of the Spirit of God, you know something has shifted, something has changed. And a lot of that fear, a lot of that shame start being peeled off of you. And then, before we go through deliverance, God began to peel more layers off. But again, it's a process. You have a lot of people in our world that's dealing with shame, dealing with fear, and dealing with control. They've had a lot of shame and effects in their life. Young women have been raped. Boys have been uh, raped, abused. That's a shaming thing. Who wants to talk about that? That they raped me as a kid. Nobody wants to talk about that, but it's real. It happens in the church. Come on now. Look at the Catholic Church. I mean, they're just now starting to deal with it. It's not that they didn't know about it, but everybody's swept up on the hook. Don't say anything. It's almost like 
uh, Amnon when he raped his sister. I got the right name. He raped Tamar. I know it was, but I think it's Amnon that raped her. And then her older brother said, Has Amnon been with you? Hush now, keep it quiet. Don't say nothing. Worst thing that can happen is don't say nothing. No, we need to talk about this happened to me. <coughs> Even though our brother had a plan, but his plan didn't change anything that happened to her. Right. The fact of, I got raped. I was abused. And I've got to live with that in silence for the rest of my life. This stuff is real. And so we got a lot of people that's dealing with this fear and shame that someone is going to find out what happened to me. And it makes them feel like there's something different, something useless now. And you're not. You're not useless. You're not different. You just was hurt. You was abused. You was raped. But listen, God loves us still regardless of what we went through. It's, it's not this society that's got everything all jacked up, all messed up. Got people all in confusion about how they should feel, about their emotions. And God wants to heal us so that we can talk about our story. We all have a story. And our stories are not the same. Your story is different than my story. Listen, we are a, a walking, talking, unwritten book. And, we, and the story is still being written. One is that we're going to get to the end. Some of us are going to actually write that book. And somebody's going to read that book and oh my God, they went through this and survived? I know I can do it. See, the problem with the church is they just tell us about, you know, get up and give your testimony. And you know what the testimony was? What? I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Pray for me in my three. That's no testimony. But that's what they give in all these churches over and over and over. But why? Because they are afraid to get up there and say, I was raped as a little boy or as a little girl. I was abused. And no one wanted me to say anything. I had to grow up with all that inside of me, and it's like it's going to explode. Why? Because society says, keep quiet now. Don't say that. You might get Uncle John or Uncle, Uncle whoever in trouble. You need to be in trouble. That's right. You know, I get thoughts when I'm preaching. Some thoughts I just keep to myself. I just laugh. But <laughs> he needs to be in trouble. All right? Okay. All right. This is making any sense to you. When we, when we deal with people, we talk with people, and, you know, listen, sometimes people come off on you and you try to figure out, well, what is their problem? Well, the, the key to that is problem. You don't know what it is. But most times, people are mani manifesting their pain, and it comes out on you. And we don't have to learn communication skills yet, how to just deal with that. I think the problem is, because we're afraid to deal with it. So we allow that stuff to be spewed at us, instead of just taking a step back and telling them, you know, I'm not the one that hurt you. I'm not the one that caused you that pain, so why are you letting me out? Why are you cursing me? I'm your friend. I'm trying to help you. So what is your real problem? Let's talk about what your real problem because I'm not it. Then you begin to peel the layers back. Because we all have something that drives us, that pokes at us all the time, that we cannot get out of our mind. It plays over and over. And over. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That little voice reminds you over and over. You don't need that thing to remind you. It's not like you're going to ever forget that. But that little demon just remind you over and over and then someone comes up and poke that thing. Sure. They say, bah! and you gotta figure out, what did I just do? But it's not what you did. As much as something you may have said, they got close to that pain. And that pain make them manifest. I remember growing up, I had this little puppy. He might have been about six, seven months old. But I loved him, he was ugly as old. And my aunt, he was a big, good sized lady, stepped on it. Mm. On that left front part, I mean, I can see it just like it is today. And he, ar, 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 you know, and I'm trying to help him. I went to grab him. What are you biting me for? I'm trying to help you. And my mom said, 
Uh, he's, he's not biting you because he's angry with you. He bit at you because he's in pain and he thought you was going to hurt it again. I got a revelation. This is what happened to us. People say things or do things. They may not even be thinking about you. They just may say something. All of a sudden, they hit that spot. And we begin to nip and bite. And we're trying, what are you nipping me for? Because they're dealing with, they got an area that hasn't been healed. I was like that for years. Me and Rome's working. These guys didn't talk that crap they talk. And it, listen, be careful what you're saying. Because you never know who's in that environment and what you said may be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And all of a sudden you get a two by four beside your head and you try to figure, what you hit me for? And you really can't tell them why. But it's what they said. It got so close to what you're dealing with, you thought that they knew something and you went off of them. And they ain't know a thing. On they know now, you got hit with a two by four and you get ready to go to jail. Yeah, you follow what I'm saying? So people are in pain, and so we need, we need to be sensitive as to how we talk with them, how we deal with them. Ben, you know, ben, the scripture says, you know, we need to be tell the truth, but tell the truth in love. Have a little mercy spring on it. Remember how you was when you was there. How you would love to have a little love, a little mercy sprinkled on what they're getting ready to tell you. I don't mind the truth, but don't kill me with it. You know, give me the truth, but don't beat me to death with it. Sprinkle a little love on it. You know, that's what Jesus did. All right. So moving on. Moving on. So we all are living stone. We're alive. We're living through this thing called life. And I think the longer you live, I think the more experience you should get, and the better you should get at living. Which when you look back and you run into people. God has made adjustments on the inside of you so that you'll know how to handle people, deal with people, how what to say, what not to say. We don't have to say everything. Just because you think it don't mean you need to say it. Some stuff you say you can't never take back and you hurt someone. So we need to think before we speak because we have people that's dealing with this stuff. All right? So it's a process. And we all have these rejection issues. Depending on your upbringing, some of us deal with rejection more than others. Some of us deal with fear more than others. Some of us deal with shame more than others. So listen, we're working, I was, we're working through it, and God is working through it with us. All right? So rejection can happen to anyone, and it can happen anywhere. I don't think people start out to intentionally to hurt us. I, I don't believe that. I don't subscribe to that theory. But yet, being human... We make these mistakes. Now, some of them are actually taught to do this. But starting out as little kids, no, that's not who we are. It's things that we've learned over the years, things that our parents may have told us, parents may have enforced. So it's like one thing I wish my mom would have told me about she never did. What's, what's uh, racism? Tell me, you don't let a kid go into the military and don't never tell them what racism is. I went in a wide-eyed, ignorant 18-year-old and Ran into a wall. Trying to figure out what is wrong with y'all. You know, what is your problem? And they look at me. What's your problem? I'm saying I ain't gonna have one. <laughs> you know, people I came from they act like y'all do. But she never told me that this was in our society. All she said was, "You will learn." Listen, looking back, I no, I tell my kids, listen, society is screwed up. You got people that screwed up in their head, so you might as well expect it. That way you ain't going to run out there, run straight into a wall. Bam! What the world was that? It's called life. So we need to tell people our experiences. Don't hide our experiences, especially from our children. Why do we do that anyway? Because of fear. <laughs> because of shame. And when we are operating with fear and shame, control is not going to be far behind. But what does control do? Control likes to manipulate everything. It manipulates everything. Don't you try to do nothing without my permission. 
Why? Because if you do something without my permission, you may slip and hurt me. And I want to make sure you can't do that. So I'll control your day, your schedule, your time. You don't do nothing without checking with me. That's a demon of control. And a lot of people operate in that thing. Yeah, come on. Ah. Okay. It's a process, and God is opening up and giving us revelation so we can start seeing it. What does sacrifice mean? Yeah. One word description. Sacrifice. What's sacrifice? Quick. Sacrifice. What is it? No. Death. 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 When you sacrifice, something's dying. Somebody's going to give up something. That's like death. All right? It's an exchange as we give God our sacrifice. He gives us freedom. When we begin open up to tell God what's going on, and here's the beauty of this thing. It's not that God doesn't know. What is it he doesn't know? He's God. He's infinite. He's all-knowing. So why is it? He just don't come on and and heal us. It would be nice. That's not a reality. No, reality is he wants us to discover what's going on. So as he begins to peel back stuff, he wants to come to the place where we acknowledge this is true. So he began to substitute freedom for release or for our pain. But we have to do this. A lot of times we don't want to even do that. Why? Because we're so, so ashamed and so fearful. We don't want God to know. <laughs> that was my revelation. I was so angry with God. I didn't want him to know. I, I, to know. I was mad. I, you know, he was telling God. I'm thinking, no, I'm not telling God. I'm not talking to him. <laughs> you get mad at somebody. You're not talking to him. They try to think, why are you not talking to me? You're not going to tell him I'm mad at you. We said, nothing wrong. I'm thinking it's okay. But you know something wrong. They give you a cold shoulder. You, they, you know, you spend time together now. You don't want to spend the time. Something's rough. So I was having this meltdown one day. By myself, I'm walking and crying and stumping. My son, like, like a kid. I was, what, 28, 29 years old? And I kept hearing this voice. What's wrong? And I kept looking around. Right there. Who keeps asking me that? Because I'm not going to tell you. Then I realized it wasn't a person. What's wrong? And I said, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing's wrong. And I kept on going like years. And he, everyone's like, what's wrong? Wow. Until one day, oh my God, I had this day. And I said, I'm mad. I'm mad at you. He said, why? <laughs> you know, what do you mean, why? You know, as he been as if he didn't know. And here's the thought that came to me. I'm about to say up here. Here's the thought. There's nothing about us that God doesn't know. He wants to acknowledge what we are. And when I acknowledged why I was angry, and the anger left, now I ain't had no reason to be angry no more. <laughs> so, so now, unbeknownst to me, I had to find something else. You know, I'm not angry. Come on. That's about a new thing, yeah. I wasn't saved. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't even angry about God. But I, I did know that he kept poking at that thing to acknowledge what it was. Then he wanted to know why. Then I told him why. And I said, you didn't do nothing about it. So I was mad at you. And I'm still mad at you, but <laughs> Yeah, like a little kid. Come on, we're all like little kids. Let's be honest. But the, the, the most eye-opening revelation that I got was he didn't kill me. And that was my fear. Because most of my life, they told us in church that God would get you. That God will get you. And that was my fear. That if I ever told him how I really felt, he would bam, like a bug. So what did they tell us? That I didn't have a revelation of who he was. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't have a revelation that he was a loving, just father. 
I just saw him at this, as his judge. All he wants to do is pass down sentence and kill people. Because I'm struggling with all this shame because I was angry with him. I'm struggling with all this fear because I'm afraid he's going to kill me. So I'm trying to control my whole life. And the more I can try to control it, the faster it spiraled out of control. So that's where the alcohol came in. People say, well, you, you're not fun to be around. You know, we go out just to celebrate, just to have a drink, and you get drunk. Like, that's my purpose. <laughs> my purpose ain't to have no fun. I said, my purpose is to stop the pain, man. They said, what pain? And I'm thinking, why am I even talking? And you wouldn't have a clear a clue what I'm talking about. Anybody here with me? I used to wonder why people do the things they do. Excuse me. They do it because they're trying to mask something. I was trying to mask my pain with alcohol. I was trying to mask my pain with marijuana. All I got was more pain the next day. Because, like I said, I wasn't a sociable drinker. When I drink, I drink a whole fifth and hope I can get home before it really took effect. That's why some days I wake up looking dry and say, who parked that car like that? What's my car? What's my pop doing in that ditch? You know, I never had no revelation that I did. Because I was so drunk trying to max my emotional pain, I didn't realize what I was doing. And a lot of people are like that. You know. So I was struggling with my own shame, my own fear, and I'm trying to control everything. And I realized looking back, a lot of people are dealing with the same thing. It may not be fear of God, it may not be. Uh, shame that you're angry with God. I mean, come on, that's a whole lot more shame than I can talk about. We're going to deal with that. You're not getting up in my business today, but you know, you follow that. So people come to church. They're not they're not born again. I come to church. I wasn't born again, and instead of getting liberated, I got more shame because I wasn't saved. You know, I, I got more shamed because I was able to stop. What I was doing. You know, I'm talking to Christians trying to find an answer, and they found a more shame on me. You know, because I can't do what you're doing. Then I found out I'm doing better than you, and you're in church every Sunday. You are masquerading as a Christian when well, you should have just been hanging out there with me, being honest. So I got to the place I said, the hit with church, the hit with all of you. And I just went to my bottle. Now, now I wasn't an alcoholic. Trust me. You know, I can work five days a week, but something happens on Thursday, or Friday, when the, like the whole world comes down on me, and I can't seem to make the weekend. So why are we talking about this? Because it's a fact that people struggle with shame, fear, but they don't know why they're dealing with it. Okay, it could be the way that you was raised up. Come on, we man, listen, people now they shop at the Goodwill when. Before that's the only place we could go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, that was a shaming effect. You, your mom went to the Goodwill, right. and you get pants that got holes in. Now that's the style. Right. Who knows? Right. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Back in those days, you get a hole. Everybody's gonna rat you out. Rat you out means talk about you. Okay. <laughs> well, you generally don't know what that is. And so. Now looking back, I said, that's the style. People shopping like they go to good words like they go to the mall. Mm -hmm. But that was a shaming effect for us coming up then. Right. But still, we all deal with it. How much time do I have? I'm going to take my time. I'm going somewhere eventually. Okay. I don't know when we get there. Okay. Well, take your time. All right. Let me give you a definition of what shame is. Let's just do that. Now, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Definition of shame. Shame is a sense of being uniquely and hopelessly flawed. It leaves your person feeling different and less valuable than other human beings. Shame is self-oriented. There is something wrong with me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever had that feeling that something's wrong with me? You look around like everybody's got it going on, but there's something I'm all messed up. What's wrong with me? Guilt is action-oriented, which means I did something wrong. But shame is different, uh, differentiated from guilt is 
that awful sense of being uniquely and hopelessly just flawed, just messed up. Like rejection is a commonality for many of us as we have accepted the lie that this is who I am. That our core personhood is one of shame. And this is what I had to struggle through most of my life. This is the work kind of ungodly belief, a false belief about who we are, about, about our identity. We are not flawed. But the enemy, Satan, his demon, wants you to feel like you are hopeless. And God help you if you get with a partner that reinforces that. <laughs> We've been in counseling with people. It could be a man or a woman, but they are so negative that they make the other person feel like they're just useless. They're just slow. They're just messed up. And I say, God, I cannot be a good counselor. Well, after, after coming out of that stuff, I'm going to jack slap somebody. Jack, you don't let me bang, 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 shut your mouth up. <laughs> this time my wife had hit me on my knee, elbow me. <laughs> you know, the, I don't forget about being the counselor about the preacher. I'm going to slap you. <laughs> you got you have no more sense than that to talk to your partner like that. And so I said, excuse me, let's take a break. And I'm thinking, that's not for y'all, that's for me. I need to go get myself back together. And so this is what shame makes you feel like. Yes, you are messed up. You're flawed. You're no good. All right. Y'all need a break? I would like to finish this. Okay, I'm going to finish this. Now, we said shame, what else? Fear, fear and control. And control. And listen to me. These are three controlling demons. A lot of people don't believe in demons, but you got them. Now, those of us that's gone through the living, I would love to say, and I will say, that we don't have as many as a lot of them got now. <laughs> but we still have some. Yeah. All right? Whereas I was used to be on the surface, you know, God sort of swept all of them off. Yeah. Now it's those things down in there that we need to get stuff rooted up out of. But we all have this thing. And so we all try to mask who we are because we have believed the lie of the enemy that our identity of who we are is so messed up. Nobody wants you. Or nobody wants to be with you. But when God began to heal your identity, your true identity, I told you when we came from Detroit after being in that chair over 12 hours, at least about 14 hours, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was just Giving up stuff because I was tired of that chair. Oh, well, after 14 hours, that metal chair, I was done. And this little lady said, Apostle, we just about finished. And I said, Whoo, I stopped celebrating too early. <laughs> but God said, We have, we have just one more thing to do. And I just filled myself with singing the chair. <laughs> what else can be left? I never forget that experience. She said, it's something about rage. Mm -hmm. We said that, when she said that, I ain't remember nothing else for the next two hours. Mm -hmm. It's like someone else came into the house and I stepped out. And when it was all over, I thought, what happened? What'd you do? And she's like, oh man, we done now, boss. Hmm? Well, what did you do? Oh, she said, we done, we done, I ain't doing anything. Y'all don't did something, I don't lost track of time. But that thing was so embedded for, for all these years of masking what happened and who I was. This is why a lot of people are so full of rage and anger because they spend years trying to mask something that they should release because society say, hush, don't say nothing. And then you begin to change your personality, your persona. You begin to wear a different mask so that you'll get along with people so they won't reject you or hurt you. Whatever you think that this person needs, that's what you'll become. And when you realize that no, now they're no longer like that one, you'll switch and put on a different one. Come on, I know I'm talking to somebody here. Amen. And so now you're wearing so many different masks that you, you lose who you are. You don't remember no more. 
who you really are. The core of your personhood is gone. It's covered up. And so when we came back from Detroit, I'm trying to figure out, man, what happened? I said, man, what happened? There's something wrong. I said, you feel like that? She said, yeah. I said, what in the world did they do to us? <laughs> <laughs> and it was weeks before a sense of balance started coming back. And I realized all that noise I had in my head was no longer there anymore. Like self, you don't want to show You got used to that. And it's not there. All the anger and rage was gone. And you, 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 know, you spend your life depending on that. And it's no longer there. You cannot depend on it because you don't have it anymore. I was messed up for weeks. Then something strange started happening. I started laughing. And that was not normal for me. Because I didn't laugh. I didn't go to comedy shows, but I didn't know about the company. <laughs> and then everything became funny. <laughs> she even got to know it. What are you laughing about? I said, I don't know, but it's fun. I laughed when she said that. <laughs> everything was funny. And I'm trying to figure, oh my God, <laughs> that really messed me up. <laughs> so, went on like that about a month. The next thing I know, you know, things got bing, centered. I like this guy. I don't know him. But for whoever he is, I'm going to like him. So I had to get reintegrated because I had to learn me. And then people around me didn't like me because they liked the other guy. He was consistent for them. This one was consistent, but not that way. It's making any sense. So when God began to heal you, you began to get parts of your who you are back, and people gotten used to this over here. Now God has brought you back to who he created you to be, and now they got to get to know you again, and they may not like the one that's showing up. Amen. But when God started disassembling those demons on the inside of us, then we began to come back who he, who he created us to be. For some, that takes a long time. It took me a long time. But it started with acknowledgement that there is something there that is not me. Because most of my life, I always thought it was me. When I learned it wasn't me, but it was something other than me. My life began to make sense to me. Because I knew that that was not me, but everybody kept saying, it is you. That's just where you are. And you begin to believe the lie. Then you try to become that. And then when God set you free, do you realize, I knew there was something. Now you hear me say that there is a voice on the inside of you that talks to you. It's not you that's talking. When I say that, people look at, huh? <laughs> what? Yeah, there's another soul on board. There's another soul in you that's not you. But it sounds so much like you. It sounds so much like you that you have agreed, got in agreement with it, with it and said, that's me. You tell you how dangerous that is. People that contemplate suicide don't contemplate all of a sudden. It's a gradual buildup of this voice telling you about how the world would be without you. How your family would be, you know. You know, be less problems. Don't have as many trouble. Many fun. If you just wasn't here, then you know you you, you fight this thing. You say no, 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 no. But as you're listening, it sounded so much like your own voice that you stopped fighting it. Then you start saying, "Yeah, that makes sense. It would be better." The next day, you know, you're doing dumb stuff. Like walking in front of a bus. And you try to figure out how that bus missed me. Walking in front of a deuce and a quarter in the military, you try to figure out how in the heck did he miss me? <laughs> yes, I contemplated suicide. I even used a psychiatrist's pills to do it. And you try to figure out what happened? 
You know, they stand to shake at me. Wake up, wake up. And I woke up. I'm still here. <laughs> what the heck is going on? Never dawned on me that God was intervening. How many times will he keep doing it? Hmm. That's the question. Hmm. I like to say he did he he do it until you get a revelation. This he did for me. But that voice that sounds so much like you would talk you into stuff because you say, well, it must be okay, it's me. It sounds like me, it's got to be me. Let me give you a for instance. Man, I'll work with you on this. We're going to quit for today. Now, all of you probably wasn't kids that you know got upset and got angry. Or someone was messing with you and instead of you pushing back and fighting back, you just walk off. But the moment you begin to walk off, the conversation start. <laughs> you should have done X, Y, and Z. Mm. You should have did this. And if you ignore that, then it switches again. Then it begin to tell you, if I was you, <laughs> if I know what I'm talking about, I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> If I was you, this is what I would have done. And many times I almost went back. Mm -hmm. That's alright, it's not working. Walk them off. But one day that happened, and, and I said, wait a minute. Right. If I was you, who are you? <laughs> That's what I said. Who are you? And there was no answer. First, I was afraid. I said, man, you are really losing your mind. But the more I thought about it, I said, wait a minute, there's something else going on here, and I don't understand what's happening. I can't seem to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But that's nothing but a voice of a demon masquerading as you. Here's the thing I believe, and I believe this because of my experience with going through deliverance. That thing will get you to act on what it said. I call it manifest. It'll manifest. In other words, it'll rise up on the inside to such a degree that you basically don't remember what's going on. This thing now is at forefront, and he's doing whatever it wants to do. Mm -hmm. And once it's done what it wants to do, he steps back, and there you are. You trying to figure out what? I didn't do that. Everybody said, "Yeah, you did." We saw you. Oh, you and you, I didn't do that. No, you didn't. We've gone through enough deliverance. I've had the experience enough times that I realized that that thing will push up into your consciousness and it overpowers your consciousness. I'm, no, I'm not sure that's what I'm just using these words. And next thing you know, it's like you're looking through a, a, a movie at, at yourself and you have no control. And when it's all over with, it goes back down and leaves you holding the bag. Yep. Hmm. And you find one you figuring out what happened. I did not do this. Well, technically, you did. I mean, it was your body. And here's the thing about demons, see. Demons are bodiless. They have no body. All they have is a soul, which incorporates your, their mind, their will, and their emotions. And the only way that they can do what they want to do, they need our bodies to do it in. I told you about this meeting we had before we were in the house, we were in the apartments, and we was having a leadership meeting, and one lady was sitting there, we're just talking. I don't remember what we think we was talking about anything. No delivery, we're just carrying on a conversation. And this thing rose up and spoke through this lady, and I said, wait a minute. I said, what did you just say? And when I asked, her voice changed. Mm -hmm. uh, no, 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 thank you. Oh my God, what the heck is going on here? Mm -hmm. And so now we're now casting this demon out of her and her sister sitting on the side, eyes like this. <laughs> and when it's all over with, the lady said, what's wrong, what are y'all doing? And her sister's eyes, do, you don't remember? She's like, remember what? And then she looked over at me and I saw a snicker, you know. <laughs> yeah, he got caught. And she said, you don't remember? She said, remember what? She said, oh my God. I said, that's what we call a demonic manifestation. 
We all saw it. We all heard it. The lady don't remember what she did, what she said. There's a soul on board. I'm going to stop using that word on board. There's a soul that gets in there and he masquerades as you. Now, when you are born of the Spirit of God, it really can masquerade, it masquerades as you, but it can't really stay. But when you're not born of the Spirit of God, he may be there 90% of the time talking through you, and you don't realize that you've been used by a demon. A lot of thoughts that you were thinking are not even your thoughts. When you go cussing people out, hey, ain't you cussing at that demon cussing through you? And you're going on with it, wagging your finger and doing all that. This is what gets me about flavors. We understand that we don't war against flesh and blood. The next thing we up in their face cussing dude. Now you got two demons arguing with each other. Stand to feet, please. We're going to stop. Got a whole minute. Uh, you got another minute to make it happen. Another minute. Yeah. Why well, don't I sit back down? So, what do you do about it? Okay. As believers, real believers, again, Jesus said in Luke or Mark, He said, These signs will follow those who what? Believe. In my name, they will cast out death. Now, what I don't understand is, you say you're a believer, and now you have become an unbeliever, you stand there fussing and cussing along with them. So what happened to you? You had a demonic manifestation, too. Instead of you realizing what's going on, and say, in the name of Jesus, I bind that spirit. I command you to hush now. And watch it. Because if it's a demon... And you operate in the power and authority that God has given you in Jesus. It's got to shut up. Instead, we get our feelings hurt. They cussed me out. No, a demon cussed you out and you took it. Where's your fight? Where's your war cry? There's got to be something on the inside of you that would cause you to get so mad that you would take that demon by his throat and say, shut up. Hey, come out of them. They'll do one or two things. They'll take off running from you. I'm talking about the individual now. Or they just start crying trying to figure out, what happened? What did I do? What was it that you did? We're talking about deliverance, folks. We're talking about Christians being like Jesus. Not being passive, coming to church, running around church, we had a great day, and everybody taking their demons going home the same way. Come on. Then they get back and they close their doors, and that demon began to manifest. You thought this was going to get rid of me, didn't you? <laughs> no, I'm with you, baby. Whatever you're struggling with is going to increase for that day because you had an opportunity to get rid of it, and no one dealt with it. Now he's going to make you pay. Your thoughts are going to increase. Your foolishness is going to increase. And there's no way you can shut it off because you did not do anything. We don't have to live that way. That's the whole point. So I lived that way for years. So that moment sitting right there, that thing right there, said, you got some problem. So I said, you the one got some problem. And then what preachers do? Went over to the church. And God said, You do have some problems. <laughs> what do you do with that? You can't walk out on God. You can't slam the door on God. Because wherever you go, He's going with you. And now that He's got your attention, He will continue to tell you, You know, you got some problems. So all I can do is sit down on the floor and cry. Okay, what do I do about it? I've been to all my life. And you know the funny thing? He never said nothing else. He it, it was just quiet. I'm not waiting on you to talk. Dad don't say what he's gonna say. He's done. Then he sends a prophet to our house. We're sitting about 12 o'clock at night drinking coffee, having cake or something. And I'm telling him this story. Now I'm laughing. I'm joking. You know, this is funny to me, all right? And the prophet, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
He said, hold on a minute. Hold on, Theo. He's the only one who called me Theo. He's dead gone now. Don't y'all try this. He pulled out his flip phone. Say, man, who you call this time? Like? Call my friend. <laughs> hey, Bishop, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good, bro. I, I got some friends here that need, need to come see you. Well, send them up here. Okay, click. <laughs> Told them what day to be there. I'm looking at it. Ah, I said, uh, I don't know about all that. <laughs> I said, you serious? Yeah. Okay, so we booked us a flight. Got us a hotel and we flew up there. Did not know what I was getting into. <laughs> Didn't know nothing but about delivering, but reading the peas and the power. Do you understand you can read that book and you get head knowledge, but no revelation? Had a lot of head knowledge. I ain't have a revelation. So I got there. Let me use this phrase. All hell broke loose. In my mind. I'd never been so afraid before. And I've been, I've been in Vietnam. And I've been in a place over there I wasn't that afraid. I was so afraid I was petrified. I'm walking, I'm pacing. And I couldn't understand what's wrong with me. Like a cage down, I'm walking back and forth at the hotel. And I was, you okay? I said, yeah, I don't know what this is. I'm steady pacing like some out of the corner of an animal. And so finally, after the meeting Friday night, we get back to the road about 1.30, 2 o'clock. We're going to be back at the church by 8 that morning. I'm thinking, I'm going home. That was my thing. When I got up that morning, I said, I'm going home. Something's wrong. I don't feel good. <laughs> I said, I'm going home. She's like, hey, how are you going to get back to the airport? You know, we, we didn't rent a car this time. And that was about 20 something miles. It's about 15 degrees out there, and about three inches of snow. And I feel like they closed the cage. <laughs> I said, oh God, what's wrong? They sent a band to pick us all up. We get into the church, and here's all the men doing this. I said, why are you pacing? He's like, he's like, I'm afraid of something. I said, oh my God. I said, what about you? Me too. I said, what is it? All the men, the pace and the women sit there. Ja, 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 ja. <laughs> we just paced back and forth, back and forth because we didn't know. The things on the inside of us knew. So it wasn't us ag agitated. It was those things that was agitated. They knew what this meant. And so when they took us up, Upstairs and began to put us in different places. Mm -hmm. I started curse firing this one attack. <laughs> I mean, I'm sweating there. I've been mean, sweating dripping off me. They said, You all right? I said, Yeah, it's a little bit hot in here. They said, But you're all right, baby. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that little lady with some blue eyes got in my face and she didn't get out my face. Like for yellow. I still see her. Everybody said, I see her right there. Now I know what that was. See, when you get into a situation, the demons know that they're getting ready to be kicked out. And they're trying to get you to run. So they can stay in there. This is real. This is not hyperball. I'm, this is real. I'm not lying to you. If, I, if I'm lying, I'm flying. And my feet are soft on this concrete. It was after all that was over that when I came home, I was like, like, like some parts of me had been ripped out. I couldn't remember it. It was gone, and I didn't feel like myself. And it took a couple of weeks to a month before things started coming back together. And I said, wow, man, this life. <laughs> That's all I said. And she's like, why, where? I said, in my mind, there's little noise. I can hear clear. And I get this phone call. This boy had jumped in my door. That was a promise I made them. No man will put their hands on you and live. I know you mad. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not mad. No, but so, I know you mad. I said, son, trust me. I said, I'm sorry to laugh. I'm not mad about what's wrong with you. I said, I don't know. <laughs> then it dawned on both of us at the same time. It was gone. It wasn't there. I didn't get mad. 
And when I got mad, I stayed mad for weeks. I ain't talking about for a few minutes. If, I got, if that thing hadn't been going, I would have ripped his head off. We'd probably be in jail. It was gone. And it was gone so much that, can I be honest? I saw it wanted to just come back just for a minute. <laughs> Just a little bit, you know. 